ever wondered what role students and student voice might play in helping you think about solutions, ideas, and potential improvements for the ways in which your school addresses mental health? Well, if you have or you haven't, today's guest is going to give us some great ideas for the role that student voice can play in our mental health environment in schools. And she's also going to share some great tips as well as her heart skill set. Today's guest is Dr. Lorea Martinez, who is the award-winning founder of Heart in Mind, a company dedicated to helping schools and organizations integrate social emotional learning in their practices, products, and learning communities. Dr. Martinez has worked with schools, districts, and organizations to guide SEL implementation efforts, including training teachers and leadership teams, and providing guidance to educational technology and media companies to help them integrate SEL in their products. We're going to talk about her book, her research, and again, the variety of strategies that are available to us. Before we dig into today's conversation, we've got a quick word from the incredible sponsor of our series. Are you in the middle of your teaching career and wondering how to best manage your finances? Money Pickles financial advisors specialize in helping educators like us. They offer practical advice on investments, savings, and even navigating pension plans. With Money Pickle, you're not just getting an advisor, you're gaining a financial partner who understands your unique needs as an educator. Head to moneypickle.com slash shifting schools today to sign up for a complimentary, no obligation video call with a financial advisor. That's moneypickle.com slash shifting schools. We thank them for being a sponsor of this podcast and of educators at large. And now, welcome to the show, Dr. Martinez. Dr. Martinez, it's such an honor to be talking about your work, your research, your commitment to mental health as part of our special series. And I'd love to start with your latest book, which is entitled Teaching with the Heart in Mind. It it helps educators really center social emotional learning, as well as what you refer to as the heart skills. And I'd love to start there. Can you tell us a little bit more by what you mean when you talk about heart skills? Yeah, so HEART is an acronym that stands for Five Essential Social Emotional Skills. And I'll tell you a little bit more about each one of them, but just to give your audience a little bit of a context for why I created this model, I wanted to offer something that was research-based for educators, something that they were confident bringing into their classroom, but also that they knew right away what we were talking about. If we said self-awareness or self-management, sometimes um, educators have a hard time really identifying what is it exactly that I do if I'm teaching that to students or if I'm using those skills to practice them myself as an educator. So with um, HEART, it identifies these skills and each one of them Um, has a verb. So for example, the H stands for honor my emotions. And that means uh, being able to name, to interpret and communicate your emotions effectively. And I would say that for this particular skill, which is actually the foundation of emotional intelligence, the part around naming emotions, that's the one that we generally get right. But the second item, which is to interpret, to really see emotions as information, as data that we have. And our job is to really to interpret, to be able to become uh, emotion scientists, as Mark Brackett says, the director of the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence, and do this process of really being able to identify those emotions and knowing why we have those feelings, interpreting their meaning. So that's the first one. The second, uh, the E stands for elect your responses. And that entails being able to create that space that is necessary 
to make constructive decisions. That means that we are able to navigate our feelings, that we are paying attention to our behavior and how we interact and how we relate to ourselves first, but also with our students and in our context, in our everyday life, and being able to do that uh, with optimism. The third skill, the A stands for apply empathy. And it is not a coincidence that it's in the middle of the model. So empathy definitely is a skill that is very important to connect with others. It allows us to interpret and connect with the emotions of other people. And in the heart and mind model, empathy also includes self-empathy. So empathy towards oneself. And I have seen, I've worked in education for over 20 years now, and my experience has been that educators, this is an area where they have a lot of struggle because we have very high expectations about our behaviors. We want our students to do so much, but when it comes to um, us making mistakes or maybe coming short in a particular situation, we tend to be very harsh. So that's something that I, I do work quite a bit with the schools that I work with to facilitate and nurture that reflection on why is that educators are so harsh on themselves and then what that means for their students. Um, so now moving on to the fourth skill, the R stands for reignite your relationships. And that has to do with all your social skills, the things that you do in order to maintain, to create a network of uh, positive relationships in your life. And I see relationships as a source of strength and support for others. And sometimes that requires a little bit of effort, right? Some relationships are easy and other relationships take a little bit of time and effort. So really doing that process in authentic ways, but also in, in with more intentionality. Uh, and finally, the last skill, the T stands for transform with purpose. And this is probably the favorite skill in the model for me because it allows us to think about the why, the why in how we make decisions in our lives, how we relate to others, and to really guide our life with a sense of purpose, knowing that there's something we want to contribute in our communities, there's something bigger than ourselves that we want to do. And that's something that we can practice as educators in our lives, but also something that we can teach to our students. So this heart in mind model with these five skills is something that as educators, we practice for ourselves, but also the same model, the same skills are valid to teach our students. So it's a model that works both for, for kids uh, and also for adults. There's two things that you said that, I love and I, I kind of just want to underline verbally, one, the model is for us as well as younger learners and the significance of us digging in there, doing the work. Um, and two, you know, you were, you use that word practice. And I think that's so important because I think sometimes when we're talking about mental health, mindfulness, social emotional learning, I think sometimes schools get it a little bit wrong when it's sort of when they place it as a, oh, we're going to have, you know, mental health awareness week or SEL month or this is the SEL part of the unit rather than it's ongoing. It's, you know, sustaining that work. You know, you pointed out that example of educators being so hard on themselves. We're notorious for that. And I'd love to illustrate that with an example from my own life um, as someone that facilitates a lot of professional learning. I've got a network of other facilitators and we often chat and this thing will happen where one of us shares a story of, hey, I had this presentation. There were 300 people as a part of this workshop. Overwhelmingly, folks were glowing and really took away a lot from it. But there was one person who didn't like it. And I lost sleep that night thinking about that one person and that one comment. Um, and often that will be shared. and Everybody else is like, that happens to you too? I thought that was just me. Um, and, and I'm wondering if, if you can speak a little bit further to this idea that, okay, you know, I, I love this heart model, this heart framework, but I can't just say, hey, we're going to look at this for this week, or this is going to be our month of heart skills. And then, hey, 
tick box. They're all done. I'm great at using this model. I, I'm a master at all of these skills. Um, could you say more about what it means to really like sustain or practice or realize that this is going to be ongoing work, not sort of like a, a tick box kind of learning experience? Yes, absolutely. I, I think that the, the change is in, it, it's a change of paradigm, really, to see SCL as something that we teach versus, or, or something that we do versus something that we are, mm. right? This, this is part of our to be a list. It's not part of our to do list. And I think that when educators understand that, it makes a huge difference in even how they are teaching these skills to students because they don't see them as this is, you know, on my schedule, Monday morning, you know, 9 to 9.30, that's when I'm teaching SEL. That might be a part of it, but it's really how we are creating that learning environment for students how we are creating an environment for the adults to work so adults can go to a place where they feel supported and happy. Um, and it's also how we relate to parents and the larger community. So I think that really seeing these skills as, as life skills, things that we need in order to be successful from one part, but also to cultivate and nurture our well-being. So if we see this, this is... Any, anything that we do in order to to support ourselves and our well-being cannot be like a, a one one time thing or something that we do for a small period of time, but truly is an effort and a practice that we do on a regular basis. And the benefit to doing that is that it becomes easier. It becomes part of our repertoire of how we are in the world. And it becomes easier over time. It doesn't feel like it's a huge effort. I think that the word that that for me is very important is intentionality. That's the difference between not being aware of how you are showing up in different spaces and being aware of your emotions, your thought patterns, and how you behave and how you relate to others. So when you're bringing that intentionality, that means that these skills are live and well in your life. That means that you are thinking about this model and you are um, using it as a guide to, um, to, to guide your behavior, but also as a reflection tool when things don't go as well. Like in the example you were sharing, um, that would be a, a great exercise to go through the hard skills and really go through and think about like how, you know, how did you feel about encountering this one person who had negative feedback? What were your choices, right? Analyzing, well, I could sleep, you know, lose sleep over it, but is there a different choice that I could have made as a facilitator? Um, what about empathy, right? How how did others feel about it? And what can I tell myself if, if I was sharing this with a friend? What can that conversation be? And so on. So there are many like powerful questions that you can ask to reflect on situations. And all we're trying to do is, is acknowledge, you know, the things that went well and things that worked out for us. And also see that there are options, there are choices that we can always make about the experiences that we have. And maybe next time we encounter a similar situation, then we're going to make a different choice. But we are going to make that choice with intentionality. Oh, I, I love that because it really, I think, positions heart as a catalyst to have more conversations, right? Which is what we what we want, I think, for ourselves and for younger learners is to not kind of, you know, just sit silently with this range of emotions or with conflicts or with the feeling of like, is this my only choice, as you point out, but to, you know, engage one another in dialogue. And I love that your work factors in parents and caretakers because schools, I think, are really looking to engage that audience in a dialogue about uh, mental health, about SEL. And sometimes there can be resistance, right? I think many of the parents and caretakers in our communities did not go through an educational experience that embraced social emotional learning. So I think there is some skepticism um, listeners of this show can sign up for your parenting tips that are available from your website. We'll include the link in the show notes. Can you share one tip that you would give to a parent or caretaker listener who wants to think about embracing social emotional learning in the home? 
Absolutely. I would say that one of the the foundational skills of social emotional learning of emotional intelligence is in and from the role of a parent is validating your kids' feelings. And that is very difficult. I I'm a mom myself. I have a sixth grader and a third grader at home. And when they come home with a challenge, a conflict, a situation that is difficult, our tendency as parents, we might have different tendencies, but some of the common ones are either to um, d- diminish or, or eliminate the pain that they are experiencing. And maybe we go into the fixing situation mindset where we're going to go talk to the parents of the kid that they had a conflict with. Or maybe we are inclined to go talk to the teacher, right? We are we get into this, I'm going to fix the situation mindset. And that is not always the, the best response to a situation where a child is sharing with us a difficult situation. I think that when we validate the experience, what we are saying is, oh, I understand what you are feeling. And if our child doesn't have the vocabulary to identify, to name their emotions, that is a place, also a teaching moment where we can help them find the words that best describe what they are feeling. And that's a part of uh, what schools try to do with emotional literacy, really teaching kids uh, to increase their, their vocabulary when it comes to emotions. So when we are sitting with our kids and they are experiencing this difficult situation, being able to help them name those emotions and give them that validation of like, wow, if I was in the same situation, I would feel the same way. Um, because the, the other side of the, of the spectrum could be when we say, Oh, don't, you know, don't be sad or don't be mad. It's not a big deal. And when we do that, when we say those things to our kids, what we are saying is we are invalidating their feelings. We are not creating the space and we might not agree with their feelings, right? I, I have a, my sixth grader is like on the verge of like turning the corner of adolescence. And sometimes I'm like, wow, this is a really big deal for you. And I might not agree with the feelings, but that doesn't mean that the child is not experiencing uh, that, you know, rage or, or that frustration or that disappointment. So when we do that, I think that it creates a very nice space to be able to have a different conversation with our kids, because in order to to get to the problem solving part, we need the time to help them process their feelings. And we cannot do that unless we help them to name those emotions and also validate their experience. So the next time that something like that happens, could be a different situation that they know that they can come to us uh, to share those feelings because I have seen um, situations where parents don't validate their experience and then kids don't want to share what they are experiencing with their parents because their parents don't create the space for that to happen. So I think that especially if you, if you know, the audience has adolescents, kids, I think creating that space for that validation is very important. I wonder if you have thoughts on how validating emotions can look differently. Um, I'm thinking specifically of how it might sometimes not even necessarily be verbal. And I'm, I'm asking this because you have me thinking about the ways in which we model this behavior all the time. So even if it's not that, you know, I'm validating the emotion of, a student, they actually might see me engage with a peer or, you know, the example that comes to mind is actually, um, a, you know, a friend had kind of complimented me one time. It's snowy season where I'm at right now. And my dog is absolutely terrified of the snow plow, but the snow plow is going to do its job up and down the street in my driveway. Um, and so, you know, I, I will often just try to like, when my dog is very upset, sit next to her, put a hand on her. And sometimes even that, I think it's sort of, you know, I I may be projecting here, but I think it's like my dog realizes, okay, I'm not alone with this scary snowplow. So do you have thoughts in terms of what it might mean to validate emotions in different ways that it doesn't always necessarily have to be a, a lengthy conversation, so to speak, but can it also be 
gestures? Can it also be nonverbal? Absolutely. I think our body language is so important. And even just taking that time um, to sit with your dog or if you have a small child and just your physical presence is important. The fact that you are giving your child a hug and maybe you need no words, right? Just um, waiting for the emotion to pass, right? To to help them know that they are safe with you and that they can have that frustration or that anger and you are going to be there holding that space for them. So definitely, I think that body language can be a great source of comfort for kids. And and also having that conversation, you know, if your kid is older, you can have a deeper conversation. But definitely, there are different ways in which you can validate the experience. And sometimes it might even be just letting them have it, right? Again, like going back to what I was sharing at the beginning, that it is very difficult for us as parents to watch our kids in pain. So of course, our our mama bear inside, right, says, I'm going to fix the situation. But sometimes kids need to be in touch with those emotions in order to maybe understand what's happening, uh, maybe to sit with it a little bit before they can process it. So sometimes just even taking a break from from any external uh, stimulus can be positive for the kid just to let them um, be with that emotion. And then you can either, uh, you know, give them a hack and have that that physical comfort or to have a conversation about it. So I feel like what you might be suggesting is that sometimes validation is also not denying, um, you know, and I'm thinking of all of the ways in which our body language might communicate, like, I, I see, I can understand that you are experiencing something hard and not ignoring or not kind of making a facial expression or using my body to sort of like wave that person off or be like, ah, you'll get over it. It's not a big deal, that kind of thing. Um, And again, I just, I think, especially for those of us who teach older students, they're hyper aware of that. You know, I think they, they even see that in terms of colleague to colleague, the way that we engage with one another. Um, And this is where, as you, you so eloquently said, it's that self-awareness and, and seeing like, how do I show up for others How do I, how have I maybe appreciated when someone else has shown up for me? Um, You know, I I think about a a time that I had to go into work and many of my colleagues knew that I had had a particularly difficult weekend and there wasn't a lot of time, but I had a colleague in the hall who just sort of put her, she put her hand on her heart, like, you know, and, and that was all we had time for, but it was sort of like, it's a quick gesture that is that validation. So You have me thinking, Dr. Martinez, that it might really be a great team conversation to have people list what are all the different ways that you have felt validated, both, you know, in conversation, but also some of those like quick, I really felt seen or understood by that person as an activity. Yes, I think that that's a a great way to have also the, the, the diversity of perspectives because we we have different love languages right and sometimes for someone to feel validated maybe they need that that space to be by themselves or they need a quick check in a quick text something that is less invasive uh, maybe somebody else really they need that that physical touch so i think that when we are creating uh, teams that are highly effective knowing how people feel supported or what to do in a moment when they are experiencing a challenge or a conflict, a difficult situation, um, might make that relationship even closer because you are having that open conversation even when it's not happening, right? Which is the right time to have it versus when someone is struggling, right? If you know that person will appreciate a card or a hug, right? I think that those are ways in which we can validate each other experience and at the same time be there for each other. And I think that um, given how hard it is to be an educator, it we have to work a little harder to create that positive environment for educators to be in schools because the, the work really takes, it, it's an emotional work with students. So as much as we can support each other as adults, that's going to go a long way in, in making sure that teachers stay in the profession in the long term. 
I love that you brought all of that up. It sort of segues perfectly into my final question for you because you know, you're know you talking about really taking the time, making the space to listen deeply to one another within your community. And when it comes to supporting the mental health of young learners in schools, you've got this fantastic recommendation that you make on your blog. Again, I'll link to it in the show notes. Uh, and that recommendation is to form a youth advisory group. Tell us more about what that might look like and how a school could get started um, to enact that recommendation. Yes, I have always been um, impressed with the ideas that kids have for how things can be better. And this is why in, in my model, there's that skill, transform with purpose. So for schools that are implementing this model, this is something that they do with, with intention. They are asking kids, okay, what are some of the challenges that we have in our school, in our community? And they are asking students to come up with for, with solutions for those challenges. And I think that it is a way to nurture change makers in our communities, right? Kids that see themselves as having the ability and the voice to solve the things that they see. And normally the the when you are the one impacted by that challenge, uh, you are gonna have a lot more ideas about how that that problem can be solved. So creating a youth advisory group, what it does is like anytime that there's a a decision that impacts students, um, you are asking for their feedback, right? And it doesn't mean that maybe all the ideas are going to come from scratch, but maybe it's something where the school is trying to change the schedule, for example, and they are trying to figure out different combinations. So I think that's a great example for a school to provide, to ask students for feedback, and they may give some examples of different models of, of schedules that they want to implement and then ask for feedback and follow through with that, right? I think that once we ask students for feedback, we have to do something with it, right? And, and be transparent about what we do. And, and that's an example with the schedule, but there could be many other initiatives that you can have at the school where the input of the students can be the center really of how you are making decisions at the school because the school is 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 as much for students as it is for adults to to do the work of teaching, right? I think that seeing students as a source of of insight and and wisdom really uh, can really change how schools do things because they are incorporating um, again with intentionality the the feedback that students have, and that can take truly from from a practical perspective different forms. It can be you know a subset of students that volunteer to be part of that advisory group. It can be more like focus groups where you have students representing different grades that come together to discuss topics. Um, It can be whole class, right? If it's part of the school's advisory or their, you know, their time when they discuss community issues, it can really take different forms. But the final goal is to be able to gather that feedback from students, especially when the school is considering making decisions that are really going to impact what happens at the school. I am just uh, like, yes, to all of that. And I think, you know, it's a perfect reminder that we we're really missing out if we're not tapping into, I, I completely agree, like student wisdom and insight and setting up structures for that. And I love that you talk about, you can experiment with the model. It doesn't need to look like any one thing, or if you have a youth advisory group, it might evolve, it might change because the students who are part of that group might evolve and change. And um, I was working with a a GSA just this week and they told me what they wanted to do 
was debunk the myth that social media is not always good for them um, and is not always good for their mental health. So we had kind of a lengthy discussion of different ways that we might campaign and do some education for the educators at that school. And they came up with this great idea that for eight weeks, they were going to get one example each week and essentially just walk through how they felt like that was great LGBTQIA representation. And so they would pick something from a different social media platform and say, this is something that is educating us, or it's simply really joyful um, and actually kind of, you know, was a positive social media experience. And, you know, they were doing that in part because they are saying, we would love our educators to talk to us from more of a balanced standpoint that, of course, social media is not always going to be great for our mental health, but actually sometimes it can be, and you know, don't assume necessarily what the teen experience online is. And I, I just, you know, again, it was incredible to see them walk through that idea. And they were so excited, actually, that adults wanted to hear from them, which reminds me, I think, all too often, they are not necessarily feeling like the school is validating their ideas or giving them that time to experiment. So thank you for that reminder. And I know that we're going to have a lot of listeners who are saying, okay, great, your blog is wonderful. The book is great. The parent tips are are insightful. I'm guessing also, Dr. Martinez, that you also would love to connect with different schools. So for someone who's listening and saying, we want to go further with your work, um, what is the best way for them to reach out to you uh, to, to connect further? Yes, absolutely. Through my website, which is loreamartinez.com. There's a contact page and they can send me a message. Those messages go straight to my inbox. So I'm always happy to hear from people that are trying different things and that they they want to support students at the end of the day. I think we are um, trying to improve students' experience in school, and that means that we need to hear about their feedback. We need to use their insights. And some of these things are not uh, rocket science in the sense that, that there's no, like, crazy ways in which we have to do this work. I think that some of it is really basic. And going back to to how we started the conversation around the importance of listening to each other and 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 making center you know relationship center schools, which somehow like we we got lost with all the student achievement that seemed to go to a second place. But I think that we have to bring that back and and really create spaces where people want to be together. Yeah. And again, I think it's a, what is the point of school, right? Otherwise. Um, So thank you so much for that. Lots of links over there in the show notes, folks, for you to learn more about collaborating with Dr. Martinez and her research. Thank you so much for spending time with us today. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. 